styles are really gonna affect this too. Like, you know, I, I had a Russian in the wackos that was all over me, like hair on soap and a seven by seven, like, you know. So today we're joined by Adam Shelley. So Adam Shelley is a multiple time world champion in ITF Taekwondo. Um, so thanks Adam for joining us today. We're going to have a little chat about maybe some rule changes and, and potential rule changes and, and things that might spice up uh, ITF Taekwondo a little bit. And um, so hopefully it'll be an interesting conversation. And I think that a lot of uh, good chats will come for it. So do you want to just introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, yeah, so, start? yeah, so uh I have a long career now and um, a lot of experience in martial arts and stuff like that. Started off with Taekwondo um, for many years, still involved with it, with my club and stuff. So I uh, started representing Ireland when I was about 15. Actually, I was 15 at a World Championships in Argentina. Um, and then sort of went consistently from there for eight years, eight, nine years solid on the team. Um, in that time, I managed to win two world titles and five European titles, along with some uh, bits and pieces and teams as well. I was lucky to be part of the three team world champions, so I was very happy with that. Um, around 2011, then I started competing in kickboxing just nationally, and um, just to add, just to get more tournaments and add some different things to my game. I uh, started representing Ireland in kickboxing around 2013, then uh, at Awakos, um, and did that on and off until 2017. So not as long in the Waco scene as I was in the ITF scene, mm. uh, and then since that, I ventured into the ring sports a little bit. Um, in order to try and make more of a smooth transition into MMA. Um, and where I'm at now, I'm looking to make my pro debut in MMA when all this blows over. Brilliant, yeah. I think that's a, it's a great background to be able to have this conversation about of like different ring, uh, different ring sizes and mats versus ring, uh, ring sport and things like that. So it, it should be a, a good, interesting chat to, to get into anyway. Yeah, that's I actually um, one thing where when, when I'm finished competing and it's all said and done, like... I want to be able to say I competed in as many like sort of martial arts and rule sets as possible. So like at the mm. moment, I can sort of check off ITF, WTF, um, points, light, K1, uh, BJJ, MMA. Uh, I think that's it. So like I just, I love, I'm just, I'm a big believer in like, you know, a, a one, a boxing as well, sorry. A one size fits all, uh, not one size fits all, but being able to transfer the skills you've learned in one to the other and sort of being able to adapt in and out. Um, just for me, that, that's a big part of martial arts and stuff. And I really like that. So it'd be good now to get in and just discuss different rules in each one and the pros and cons. I suppose a good place to start probably will be uh, like the first transition because you you were ITF for a long time and that would yeah. be in your base, and um, so that that first transition of ITF to Waco kickboxing, like do you want to just kind of go through the the transition there of the, the kind of like switching over style slightly and the rule set change and things like that? Yeah, so um, a big like one of my biggest sort of reasons for trying to get into a bit of kickboxing was as I said to do more uh, competitions. And then um, the Slovenians would have been quite successful around that time. It was before we, like Ireland, had our break. It was around beginning of 2011, end of 2010, we, we ended up getting it. Um, and a lot of them would have been sort of cross with Thomas Barada, like, you know, crossing over to a bit of, uh, they were more light contact, actually, I noticed back then. So I said, look, I'll give it a go and see if I can sort of add some of these uh, tools to my game. And I suppose the biggest thing I did find lacking in my game when I made that transfer um, was my hands. And then secondly, um, my sort of mindset to continue a combination. Mm. So for me, it would have been, you know, maybe psychic, psychic, in with the hands, three, four punches, and then expecting a break and play. When So I was nearly switching off after three or four punches and then getting hit and nearly looking at the referee to go, why aren't you stopping this? Um, so it took a little bit of time for me to adjust to that um, and that, that would have been the biggest challenge I, I, I noticed a lot of the guys who have gone from ITF and played around with a bit of light contact have struggled in that area flow yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I'm going to like not to derail that one I want to kind of take a little step back there because um, uh, at the time like by this, when you were going to say Argentina in 2009 and New Zealand in 2011 you were also coming from having put a fair bit of time into WT. And that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the reason this kind of jumped out at me, it was only just before we came on the call. I was thinking I had a little bit of a nightmare in New Zealand going into the ring, 
and we got caught with a rule change on the hop. And yeah. it was that that meeting that you have sometimes, the, the umpires, after the umpire meeting, the coach would be brought in. And for this championship, we've changed the following rules. And it was the first time where uh, a kick to the back, a, like, and the way it was worded was yeah. like a deliberate kick to the back was going to be a foul rather than a warning. And uh, like prior to that, you'd be lucky to, like, it wanted to be a, a fairly heinous kick to the back before you get a warning for it. It, w- it had to be clumsy. And now we're like, well, what? So now, where's the accidental kick to the back? Where does that fall? And exactly. you ended up getting two mi- like a minus point in your first match and I think two minus points in the next match. That was match. against that Puerto Rican guy, wasn't it? It was yeah. Puerto Rico. I actually forgot all about that. Yeah, spot yeah. on. Uh, but, he was feeling like a lunatic, yeah. But what was that? And, and that was the whole thing. And it was just, it was a, it was a, a, a very sudden rule change and in interpretation about intent. Um, but what was jumping at me was like, well, at that time, you were coming from WT and that like... That double dolio, it was like, we'll go to the hands and we'll bum bum, we'll go with the two legs, you know, was kind That's of almost right. part of the game at the time still for you as well. And it's like that one small little change in the rules that came in just before the championships based on the background that you had, all of a sudden left you liable for those minus That's points. That's right. Um, and that's something as well, I think, um, to discuss about like maybe how we can maybe get into it later on about how the rule changes come about in ITF. As you were saying there, Adrian, we like that was so sudden. Um, mm-hmm. It was just literally like we probably figured it out on the ring what was going on and then maybe had to adjust in the middle of the spar. So maybe to have these rule changes come in a little bit more gradual or pre the event, like, you know, to give yeah. t- competitors a time to adapt and adapt their games to that. Yeah, but definitely. I think that was one of the first times that uh, on the on that highest level, because that was world world championships, where you could just see this like really direct, you know, relationship between okay, we've trained according to this particular rule set, and you know, even though a kick to the back was never allowed, it was something that was like well, because there wasn't much of a penalty for it, you could steal in that little technique from WT that wouldn't really cause you any problems, and it meant. No matter how the person stepped back, you still had a good chance of getting that score. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, no, no. That's a big penalty. It's a, you're, you're potentially facing into a, you know, a point deduction. Um, but then as you're jumping back and re-putting the train back on the, on the tracks again um, and getting that transition over into light contact, um, what did you find different in terms of the rule set? That, or how do you feel that the rule set shaped your training and shaped your your play i suppose um i suppose this should be in itf anyway but a never switch off type of mentality and um, like when i'm explaining itf to people now like if anybody's ever asking me you know what rules with itf i'd often describe it as being halfway between points and light contact and um, in terms of flow so like obviously points fighters can grab a shot to the body or head and then once they hear it stop, they can nearly switch off for a second, fix the glove, re- regroup, and go again. Um, taekwondo then obviously is a step up from that. You can have your small, maybe short hand exchange, finish with your turn and kick. You're nearly always getting a head show, I find anyway. Mm-hmm. Again, regroup, look at the board, how am I doing? Glance maybe back at the coach and continue. Light contact is nearly... I've watched many light contact fights where the referee hasn't intervened once throughout the round it's just continue maybe the odd break step and go again and um, so that that then i found myself trying to bring into itf where i was i was never and also to tidy up as well and not give the referee a reason to say hey joe to keep my scores and everything as clean as possible so that i'm happy to go here for two minutes without stop no even even for five seconds and yeah, yeah, yeah. I really started to try and address that and put away all them little niggly warnings or breaks in my game. So, and I found that out. Well, like, on, on that as well, like the, the whole idea of a referee not having a big major part to play, if you, if you don't recognise or realise who the referee was in a match, you might watch a match and you say, geez, I didn't even realise the referee who it was there. That's actually a good sign because there's a nice flow to the match and they're not really getting in, involved and breaking it up. And that might bring us on later of like, um, time and things like that and I, 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 I believe that there's way too many stoppages in, in, in ITF at the moment and especially like the, some referees in particular might take so long to give a warning there might be like 15 seconds left in a match and somebody's really looking for that last score and it mm-hmm. might 
take that seven, eight, nine seconds to give a warning, which I, I think is uh, that we'll probably get into that later. But you know, it's just it's the the more that the match will flow naturally, I think the better. It's funny that you say that actually because. I can't remember who told me this, or I definitely heard it. Um, the World Championships in Germany, there was a lad, I think it was one of the Irish lads, um, he was competing and very smartly figured this out at the time. I respect any kid to figure this out. So we noticed that the referees were being um, quite strict on where you have to stand. Um, you know, mm. let's, say after, let's say you leave the ring and you come back in. Yeah. They were being very... Uh, strict on that and they're saying no no you need to go here not over there or they're being long to give a warning or whatever that may be and he was purpose so if he was winning the match he was purposely stepping to the wrong place and mm. making the ref because he knew the referee would waste maybe five to ten seconds and putting them back and he's winning the match so yeah. like respect to the fighter for sort of figuring that smart mm. smart tactics but i just what you just said there i don't think the rules should allow that to happen yeah. The, I, yeah. I would imagine that his opponent would thank the referee more for just starting the match and let him get back to work in yeah. terms of getting the points back rather than spending all that time just figuring out where the match he actually should be, you know? Mm. Maybe, a good, maybe place. a good place to kind of... Yeah, go on, I was just going to... I was going to say a good place to start might I'd be actually... We're on the what's, track, the, what's your picture in your head? How should ITF sparring look? Well, I we'll figure out what the rules do to it, but let's, let's figure out what yeah. should it look like. So when we look at the rules, right, it's, it's semi-contact. Uh, again, that's another debate in terms of contact. But if we look at flow first, it is supposed to be continuous sparring. Um, and I understand that it should be clean um, and tidy and everything. But um, I, like what we were speaking about earlier on, there should be as, as little stoppages as possible in that match. And from an entertainment point of view, people outside the sport, even inside the sport, I just think the ones that flow, the quality exchanges of hands to feet, the hands to feet spins, they're the most entertaining matches. They're the ones I want to watch anyway. Mm-hmm. Most of the matches, when I, whenever I'm discussing with anybody about great fights that I've seen in the past, are normally the ones that had the fewer, fewer stoppages in them, and we got to see good action. Um, so therefore, I suppose, in order to get that, there's a few little things we need to address. Um, maybe how strict are we being on warning? So maybe the referee doesn't have to stop it every time to give a warning. Maybe a verbal warning would suffice. You know, watch your kicks to the back rather than head Joe, boom, continue. And um, maybe that could just improve the flow. Um, with, and it, it, uh, one thing I noticed, you know, off, let's say clashing kicks, maybe like if you've got two, like come to mind, Luke Moriarty and Luke McGrath, uh, in a final one time them lads can kick vertically like you know they're not intentionally kicking low but sometimes maybe an inexperienced has referee, bottom, yeah. one has to slip under one kick has mm. to slip yeah. under so they might give a warning for that so I'd like to see maybe some of them things eradicated to improve that you know mm. so we're basically yeah so the focus there is on uh, a, a, a continuous flow that the, yeah. the match has minimal interaction from the referee so we're again thinking much more like what we'd expect from a ring sport or the, yeah. the referee kind of hovers, uh, but is more or less in the background unless there's a, a bad intent, shall we say. Um, there so, we go. Yeah, yeah, every now and again, bad stuff happens, you know, messy stuff happens, but unless the intent is you know, to do damage, to, to break a rule, to do whatever, then the referee is more or less staying out of it. Um, you were saying, you're, you're starting there on the contacts, uh, so what, where do you feel the contact is, should be, and what's the effect of having rules around contact? Um, I think, as far as I know, from what I was looking at in Germany, uh, I wasn't in Bosnia, I saw bits and pieces. Um, from talking to people, I actually think it had hit sort of rock bottom, if you like, around maybe 2017, 2018, especially when, it, when you look at 2018, wasn't there four lads in the minus 70 division disqualified? Yeah, Slovenia. Uh, sorry, yeah, Slovenia. Um, and then... 2019 didn't seem that bad, so maybe it's an area they addressed. I'd still like to see um, maybe a tiny bit more because I think nowadays when you look at athletes doing strength and conditioning and everything, they're they're naturally going to be hitting with more force, like they're more capable of taking force and giving force. So therefore, I think on the referee side of things, that should be allowed to to let go. Um, And then just on that, me personally would like to see uh, a full contact discipline added into Taekwondo. So... When we look at full contact, semi-contact, uh, there's obviously people who prefer to maybe keep their sport in semi-contact, and that's completely fine. Like, you know, everyone, there's great positives to that. 
But then there's people who would go, no, I'd, I'd love to try full contact. And at the moment in ITF, um, and this is where I found it, this happened with me, when I started getting curious with it, um, full contact, let's say, you have to leave the sport in order mm. to, to be able to give it a go. So if we, when you look at, let's say, the WACO setup, they've got seven disciplines. So if somebody's a points fighter or a light contact fighter, they can try their hand at the ring go back they can go k1 low kick and they can they're still within the same sport under the one umbrella um, and i just think it'd be it'd be cool to give fighters that option to experience the ring and experience full contact fighting i suppose there's another option on that just, as well just on that there the, the idea yeah. of um sorry. go ahead richie so i was just going to say on, on the contact side of things there uh, when you when you look back to that uh World Championships in Germany. I remember um, Bartos and Sebastian fighting in plus 85. Mm. And clearly the both lads wanted to, they, they were enjoying the contact and, and one person wasn't like shying away from it. But then I, I do feel that the minus points were starting to impact that match negatively. Okay. And there was a nice flow to that match. And, and of course, these guys are big guys. So like, it's, like the contact is going to be naturally a little bit uh, heavier like but um, I, I think when, when both guys are, are willing to just maybe up that contact slightly I, I don't see any negative impact of uh, leaving that flow a little bit you know just like we talked about flow earlier but when, when the referee is looking to intervene there I think it just takes away from that match especially when both guys are, are interested in, in, in leaving it go a little bit you know what I mean 100% yeah and then I suppose like from a referee's point of view of course, as that's a great example of Bartosz and Sebastian, two big lads, skilled lads, probably touching a hundred k, over a hundred k. Oh yeah. Um. So obviously, you're gonna have to adjust your refereeing compared to then if you're refereeing the fifty-seven kilo lads. Like you know, yeah. um. As you said, Richie, assess the situation. All right, these two boys are up for it. Whether uh, were they first round actually? Did I, did I mean um, first? Round? No, I don't. I don't remember that now. But it, I don't think so. Either. It doesn't actually matter. It, it was early on. Yeah, it was early on. But It was early on. A uh, final, or let's say it's a final. So two lads in the final. There's a world, tit- world title on the line. Mm. Skilled, ready to go. I'd allow that push up for sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Just... And I, 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 I imagine as well, though, that, that um, with the referees being kind of watched now as well and maybe a little bit of selection going on for the, for the umpires and the referees, I wonder how much that impacts on them wanting to do the right thing and making a good impression as well. And it, it might might kind of push them towards actually being a bit more involved than they need to be. Okay, to I didn't that know that was impression. the case, actually, yeah. That I, I never actually thought of that way, that it's, it's a selection sort of process, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely is. <clears throat> okay, mm, that's yeah. interesting. I actually, I never thought of that. So, yeah, so I wonder say, subconsciously are they trying to make a good impression, like you know, and, and especially if somebody from the tournament and umpire committee is around and, and and they're keeping an eye. Like, I wonder is that playing in the back of umpires' heads that okay, I need to get involved here and make the correct choices. You know, could be, yeah, definitely, mm. definitely. I suppose then, yes, it's what sort of side are you on or what what's your frame of thinking? Like for me at a World and European Championships, uh, it should always nearly be about entertainment. You like, you know, because if we're trying to get this sport out there to people and really encourage it and, you know, I think it so the free-flowing uh, type of fight is definitely going to hit the entertainment side and that's what people are going to want to see. So uh, even the guys who are making the decisions on who's getting selected or whatever should probably be encouraging that maybe and maybe feed it from the top down so that the referees are understanding that, well, hold on, if this is a free-flowing contest with lots of action, that's going to have me, like, praised, you know, and that might sway their decisions then and stuff, you know. I think where you get at is, uh, like you said, the entertainment part of it is definitely a consideration now. But what we have is, uh, I think, a really interesting thing that happens where without a really good definition of what the sport is and is meant to look like, like a really clear statement on that, every little tweak you make in the rules pushes it somewhere because the athletes and the coaches are going to analyze what they can do and how to leverage that to get the best advantage given the rule set. And, you know, sometimes people will react almost negatively to the fact that, well, you recognize there was a, a possibility there within the rules to gain an advantage and you took it. Like, well, but that's not what we mean. You know, it's like, well, what you mean doesn't matter what you wrote into the rules is what matters and that's where i think instinctively most fighters and most coaches have a big problem with the contact part of it because semi-contact's not a thing 
yeah. it, you know, it's a case, it, it just, it, you know, the reality is that we will score if we have a touch. Like there's no requirement under the rules for the technique to be of a particular power before it touches or of a particular speed or with a particular tool. Like it has to be with the foot or it has to be with the hand. It has to be extended in some form of technique, but it doesn't have to be, you know, there, there are no kind of technical check marks for the, for the technique mm. and there's no contact yeah. check marks. But then there's the bit of, oh, but if the dial goes into the red, you know, whether it's visually or because the person who got hit really got hit and felt it or whatever, it gets very hard to define. Whereas full contact, super easy to define. Boom, that's what it is. Yeah. And then the ones that are going anywhere else, typically like they, light contact in, in, in kickboxing and ITF Type 1 in terms of their, their rule set, they're a little bit arbitrary. It's a little bit tougher to figure out where the contact is. Whereas then you jump to karate or uh, 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 point fighting in, in, in kickboxing. It's like, well, if any touch is going to do, you're not going to go and like telegraph the movement by winding it up. You know, mm, you want it. It, it. It's going to kind of work against you in the sport to wind up the shot. Um, so it's only with the like the mismatches, the highlight reel stuff, where you see someone really get a smack in those. Um, I think. But uh, so if you start on that basis. You yeah, know. I suppose then as well, like, um, and I've had this conversation with people before, sort of comes down to the sport versus art side of things, doesn't it? So as we're saying, so some referees or people in the tournament committee or anybody really in Taekwondo, like a lot of them are in it, like sort of, you know, from the art side of, and, you know, traditional and stuff like that. And I suppose... I would imagine 80 to 90% of people getting involved in Taekwondo have gotten involved from a self-defense point of view. So, and then the mantra is sort of, you know, one blow, one victory and stuff. So that's why I nearly think at the moment, as we're saying there, Adrian, about like the way the rules are and stuff, it's a little bit contradictory that in one breath, we want people, you know, bang, fight over. That's obviously from a self-defense point of view. And, but then in sparring, we're being critical of contact. And I understand that, um, it's about skill and all that, but this is what, when I mentioned earlier on about the full contact discipline, that would give people that avenue to go, well, okay, my techniques that I'm training day in, day out, if it's from a self-defense point of view, it gives you a platform to sort of see, well, does this work? Can I deliver it with intent mm. and get myself out of Dodge on the, on the street or whatever it is? Anybody that wants to sort of try their hand that way, um, it would give a good platform there. And then, I suppose, yeah, it's still about tidying up the, the math side of things because it's still quite subjective. But it would just give people an avenue to go, well, here's an option for me um, to, to try out my, my full intent. Yeah. Yeah, I think that could be cool. Yeah. So let's, let's go down a rabbit hole a little bit here then. Okay. okay yeah. so, so let's say what we have is not a fight, it's a game. Just yeah. as, right, let's just jump to that logical argument. And we're, what we're doing is we're going into the ring to see who can score the most points and win a, win a game. We've got to control a few elements to make it possible to win that game. And one of the things we have to be able to control is, you know, where we're positioned in the ring, how far away we are from our opponent and what tempo this match is happening at. And some of those things, depending on the rule set, the control is obvious. So if you're in a point stop version of a rule, rule set, well, each time there's a score, we reset to the middle. You know, that's how that typically yeah. works. So you don't have to worry about controlling for space very much. You can give up some space as long as there's a, a score, because when there's a score, we reset. Mm -hmm. You don't have too much to think about or worry about with, versus warning. So every time there's a break, it's pretty much to see who got the score. Um, so there's just a little bit of excitement. Who got the score? Is it on the scoreboard? You know, are they getting the reward for the shot that they threw? If you go to full contact, well, then your ability to take shots and give, you know, your endurance, your ability to give shots out, uh, you know, the, the amount of clean shots you land versus the, what you take will, de will determine an awful lot of that, you know, that, that space, that distance and the tempo that you can go to. Um, so really, when we jump into the middle ground, all of our rules, are, you know, why is there a warning for traveling? Well, we want you to stay in the ring. Yeah, yeah. But if the contact isn't allowed to be heavy, well, what mechanism have I got to keep myself in the ring now, particularly if the exactly. ring gets small? So yeah. maybe we'll push some of those dimensions and see, can we arrive at a game that works like Adam pictured it in the beginning where it's continuous, there's a bit of contact, it's exciting, 
and, and let's see what happens. So Richie, do you want to bounce out a rule there or a rule change and let's see what Adam thinks might happen or how he'd adapt to it? If we were going maybe a bit more full contact? Well, any particular rule change that you'd have in mind to try and make the game more exciting and let's see how Adam thinks he'd break it or implement it or Right, yeah, I get it. you. Yeah. Well, I suppose we, we, we could um, maybe experiment with that uh, rule that they have in the, in the other ITF groups where you, you must spin um, per round. I, th like, I think that's a good rule. I, again, from, from the entertainment factor, like, you know, everyone loves to see, see that and it would encourage that a little bit more. Um, and from an evolution of the sort of moving on from where we are now, the way it's very predominantly psychic blitz, that could even just pull back a little, little bit of the WT style and, you know, go back to where maybe it was a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, what's, what's the yeah, sort see, of... The, rule, the, the rule set does really dictate. What's the consequence for not spin? Point deduction. Point deduction, is it? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, and is there a rule on how many spins? There is. Now, to be honest, I don't have that off the Must top of my head. spinning action, is it? Yeah. Okay, spin action, yeah. Um, yeah, I think stuff like that could go a long way. Um, definitely. And, mm. you know, it would just add some spice to it for sure. So if, um, you're, if you're facing into that and you know you've got to land a spin, what's your thinking? How do you, how do you approach it differently? Uh, from, from a competitor's point of yeah. view? Yeah, or from a coach's point of view and you're sending your competitors in there, how are you going to make sure that they, they land that? What are you thinking? Um, now, are we talking about, sorry, uh, in the ring here, we're not talking about back in clubs and how we're well, training. I, yeah, pr pretty much like, you know, what are you going to do to make sure that they're not going to be disadvantaged by that rule? Or just drill it more. Yeah. 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 And just get encouraged them to throw it and everything like that, you know, and try and then let it cross over. Yeah. Sure, and encourage, yeah. Uh, yeah. Change the sort of counter style a little bit and get them, get them really going on it. Yeah. That would be definitely the, the way I go, mm. go about it. Yeah. What, what about the idea of points how the points are, are awarded for each technique any any suggestions on that how you can change it to spice up things and encourage a bit more action um i suppose maybe go um when you uh, this in points as well um award for jumping techniques an extra point when you jump that has been there in the past certainly yeah mm. when, when, when was that taken away um <sighs> I want to yeah. say in around the early 2000s, early yeah. 2000s. I think that was gone by 2004. Junior World Championships in 2004, I think it was gone. Right. I, I think I, I like that idea. Um, and like this from, from my, my style of, of sparring and stuff, when I was competing, like I wouldn't have actually thrown many jumping kicks, but I know for sure if I was getting an extra point for it, I'd be, I'd be looking for them shots, like, you know, and, and, Set and train and trying them out more because um yeah it's gonna pay you back a lot more I I really like that one um definitely good to see that and then actually I remember I did um I competed in an event it was a fight night uh, at the end of 2018 skill striker it was called a lad run it over in the UK and his idea behind it was to really bring the entertainment value from like ITF and Wacko as well. So it, the card was mainly made up of ITF fighters versus Wacko fighters. And the scoring system was, was mad. Like it, I think it was like five points for a jump spinning head kick, mm -hmm. like four points for a jump head kick, three for a spin. Uh, I must get it actually in St. this. but them type of shots were hugely credited and awarded and there were some fantastic fights on the night really good and like mm -hmm. everyone was just going out and trying this stuff now in saying that it was a fight night so there wasn't yeah. much on the line or it wasn't we're not talking like the world championships here but everybody wanted that five pointer or whatever it was yeah. you know and uh, it's just awesome great stuff so I, I think awarding these unusual shots or sort of spicy shots could be definitely a way to go how about looking at a, a, a gap in, 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 in scores? We say if somebody gets a certain lead that they become the winner or whatever, or if you're, if you're falling behind by a certain amount of points. I, I know there was um, a form of WT uh, did that before just for, again, entertainment value, that if a gap becomes a certain amount, so it always keeps the attacking side looking for more and it always keeps the defending side looking to, to get after more as well. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, because and then as like we've all seen matches where it's ridiculously one sided, and you know someone's just pressing forward, and it's like, or they they keep getting hit with shots, and it's like, all right, this we we're all done with this, like you know. And then as well, everyone loves to get a max, like you know, like when you see them points and it's a ten point lead. Light contact. They introduced it back in 2016. It's a 15 point lead on two judges. I'm pretty sure you need. And um, they introduced it there, and like everybody is pushing for that max to get the max. And like if they're close to it, as you said, so you still get to see action. You still get to see plenty of shots rather than somebody being up, let's say 10 points, and they just decide to dance then mm-hmm. and just moving around. They're still pushing for scores, so it keeps that engagement throughout match, and then. If it comes, you get your 15-point lead or whatever it is, match is over, done. Um, mm. You get to go on to the next one. But, uh, yeah, I think I like that, um, to, to increase the engagement. Another thing as well, um, do you remember in Germany they did the semi-finals and finals on another day? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in Bosnia, did they go back to the old way? Yeah. 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 I like that system that they had in Germany. I'd like to see that kept in permanently. Um, Again, for my style of competing, for what I would prefer when I'm actually in there is to just do all my fights straight through because I get into a rhythm. I get I get into a, like an economy mode where I can sort of pick scores, and that's what I was sort of good at. But when you see fighters who are like really explosive and like sort of really high work rate, I think that little break in play for them in terms of fights will allow them to sort of. Uh, give more output because they're not worried about gassing out before their semi-final or final or whatever it may be and we've all seen as well the way some of the draws can go when you get to quarterfinal semi-final final then fights can start to get very close together so maybe in the back of your mind you're thinking oh well I can't exert too much here I have to play this safe and again coming back to the entertainment value it steps down a bit whereas if somebody's going this is my last fight of the day I'm not fighting again till tomorrow or Saturday or whatever it may be you could see a great fight there, like, you know, and see some lovely explosive shots. Just, yeah, just I on think... that one as well, I think the the, the ranking uh, could could also help that if, if you didn't have, you know, if there were, if you weren't meeting very top level guys in the first round, for example, I think that, that could yeah. be very useful. Um, but just, just picking up on, the, on that point as well, I think that um, that idea of giving people, especially juniors anyway, um, that like almost like a win feeling for one day is actually quite useful because, um some juniors who might get to the semi-final, for example, may have never experienced that winning feeling, as in it couldn't have gotten any better for them that day. So, but where as they continued on, maybe they would have lost the semi-final. They know lost or are kind of coming coming from a low a little bit, even though they might have got a bronze medal and that might be um, a nice little award at the same time. But uh, having that experience of having like a winning feeling, like that day couldn't have gone any better, and then it allows them push on. I think that that actually kind of like springs the sport up a little bit and gives people a little bit um, a little bit more hunger to achieve more as well. I think just experience and that. Just That's a great note. point. And then not to mention for the for the supporters, like you know, there's nothing like sitting down on a Saturday morning and going, "What's our schedule like today?" And it's semi final, final, semi final, final, semi final, final. That's a great day's watching, like you know, yeah. all the sort of all the spade work is done, spread out over the air, over the arena throughout the week. And then you get the Saturday morning. It's like right here we go. Get the cameras out, and it's it's great. Like you know, we even seen it in Ger- you know, Germany. I know was spread out in terms of them being on other rings, but when you got set up like in a particular spot, it was brilliant. Like you know, just getting to see high level ma- after high level match. Yeah, I think that's one where if you take most countries like the Saturday or Sunday, you know, is when people can be off to come and watch. And, you know, when you're, people aren't, ne- unless they're related, they're not going to take time off work to come and watch the championships. So, you know, if they do come along, it'll probably cut, arrive on the Friday evening and watch Saturday, Sunday, or watch a day and go home. So like being able to line up consistently good, entertaining stuff, uh, you know, for the, the Saturday and Sunday is, you know, is definitely a, a win from an entertainment point of view, I think, as well. And also from the live streaming point of view, it's much easier to manage that where, you know, you don't have to have as many fights going on. You can, you, you know, you can see severely limit the number of matches that are happening. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, you can dial in and focus in on them a lot more. And I think that's like showcases the champions, you know, it's, I think that's something that's that we miss. 
that brings me on to something else actually as well that I was thinking about before. Um, I know it seems to be very inconsistent. Uh, some competitions do it and some don't. Having a finals night, I think, yeah. at every competition. Um, I Maybe sometimes logistically it's not possible. I'm not really sure the, the behind-the-scenes stuff there. But again, um, I, again, I saw clips. Bosnia did it. You know, the lights on, get everyone around, and a bit of music walking out or whatever. And to showcase that then, if, if the videos are released to that, like, you know, and that's out there on YouTube for people to see it as sport, I think it can be very positive, like, you know. Yeah, I always have a, a little bit mixed feelings of it because it depends what fights they pick or what, when they pick it, when it falls in the schedule. It can be quite inconsistent. But I definitely feel like, you know, if you're in the final of a world championships, it deserves to not happen in a corner ring unannounced yeah. in the middle of the day kind of thing. It, it, it deserves to be on that center stage, you, you know, you, you should have the opportunity to be under the spotlights on center stage and you, you should have to win it on that, you know, on that level as well. I mean, it, you know, it, it's one of those things where you don't want to win it off the, you know, the judges in the corner, you know, with nobody watching, you want to win it off of, you know, that top, you know, under the scrutiny of it and with the light shining and the whole lot of it, you want to like, just go, yeah, everything is done. I proved it today. There we go. And, Absolutely. um, take that short walk to the podium, you know? Um, yeah. yeah, no, I think that'd be very... And then, like, from across all discipline, well, sparring and patterns, I know special technique and power you might not do under them circumstances, but having both, and I just think, like, I know even from my parents going to competitions, like my mom and dad, like, they when they're over there, they'd always say, it's our finals night, like, you know, it's their gala night, like, you know, I think they, they love it, and then from a supporters, the supporters all coming over, like, you know, paying their money. I think they're nearly owed a little show. Like, you know, they can go get a beer, sit down and just mm. watch the best of the sport do their thing. Like, you know, I, I think that'd be great to see. I, I've often thought even just, if you could have, you know, at the end of every day after the first almost, or even with, you might have something after the first day, like you might just have your patterns finals, but like if have the days a little shorter and the last hour, you know, or whatever it happened to be, you know, of each day, just be looking mm-hmm. at the, the finals, you know. Yeah. So everyone's done. Everyone can pack their gear away. They can stay and watch if they want to, if they've got an interest in it. The crowds can come in. It's in the evening, you know, and you've got that last kind of, like, right, this is where we crown our champions. And if you're not getting your medal, you can bugger off home then, you know, at the end of it. Yeah. And, you know, it. Uh, it's, but, it, yeah, it's a tough call. But uh, I suppose going back to the 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 in-the-match rules that, uh, you've obviously made the jump from fighting in an eight by eight to a seven by seven. Mm. Um, how did you find that? Because uh, you're a tall lad. Yeah, I, I found that a big difference now, and especially I suppose the styles are really gonna affect this too. Like you know, I, I had a Russian in the wackos that was all over me, like hair on soap and a seven by seven, like you know, and it's just changes everything, like you know, but. Yeah, I found it just, it really then encourages a lot of in, more in close fighting. And yeah. you know what, especially when you watch um, the plus 94 kilo men in a whack house fighting on a 7x7, seven seven, that ring starts to look very, very small. Like, you know, two big steps back from them and they're, they're touching the red. Like, you know, mm. obviously then 57 kilo or whatever it's not going to be as sort of obvious but um yeah in terms of a transition point of view for me i found things had to sharpen up a lot more in terms of footwork evasive movement because you just you just haven't got that big uh big open space to to move around and have your luxury of just dancing around of course exits come into that as well what's that exits in terms of you could you only have three exits is a disqualification isn't it yeah what's it at now i think it's four is a four, yeah. Four. Obviously, that kind of plays into the ring size as well, like big time. And then you you get to see a lot of action because of that. Uh, interestingly, actually, I watched them. Um, I was watching the breakdown that you guys did of uh, Julio and Timmy. Mm. Uh, I, I saw a bit of the breakdown, and then I just I watched the whole fight then through. And in the extra time of that, for example, now I know like they're sixty three kilos, so they are sort of small. Um, in the extra time, Julio nabbed a lovely side kick uh, at the very start. It's probably only five, ten seconds in. And he's really good with evasive movement. And he was able to move, move. And I don't think there was one more exchange for the rest of the match. Um, 
and that, like obviously that being an eight by eight, I think with a slightly smaller ring there, seven by seven, it just gives people, and especially as the smaller guys, 57, 63, even 70, a yeah. little bit more maybe opportunity to cut off the ring, get that engagement back and potentially pull back the fight. See, but yeah, it's, there's a trade-off there, isn't it? I mean, it, it's, it, it brings around, as I said, there's definitely going to be more interaction. The challenge then is, well, if you change that, what other things have to change to allow that interaction? Because, you know, you, as I said, the, if the exits are heavily penalized, you've got to stay in somehow. And to keep the other person off of you, you either have to have really, really good in close movement ability, mm-hmm. um, or you've got to hit harder, <laughs> you yeah. know, and make them consider moving back. And, uh, you know, you've got to be able to defend your patch. And like that, that becomes a big challenge for us because. Well, if you're going to get disqualified for hitting them hard, disqualified for leaving the ring, um, and, and you can't clinch because that's a foul too, uh, you know, you, you end up in this weird like catch twenty two of like, well, damned if you do and damned if you don't. So that's right. I suppose it ties back to what we were speaking about earlier about warnings and maybe being, maybe potentially the referees being a little bit more slack on warnings, like you know, and not picking every. So as you said. There's going to be more engagement, therefore you're probably getting a little bit more slop with that. Um, it's not all going to be tidy clinical stuff. There's going to be a little bit of messing involved. Um, so yeah, that's where maybe, especially the, the minus points at the moment, with it, with it being three minus points and disqualification, um, I think you either need, something got to give there, that either needs to go to five and then keep it the way it is, or keep it at three but be less trigger happy to give the minus points. What do you think of that? Yeah. See, it's almost like, uh, you know, it, it being really, really clear about what those fouls are for. Like, I think there's an almost like a, uh, there's an in-between level that's needed there somehow in that, like, the fouls are meant to be for the big stuff. It's meant yeah. to be that, look, you're a danger to the other person in the ring here. Like, or I can understand the holding one because it's, it's like obstruction in, mm-hmm. in football. Uh, you know, it's it's stopping the person from having an opportunity to score. That's going to be penalised by taking a score away from you. It's like giving a penalty, right? Totally get that one. Um, I think it's when you know when you are starting to see those come in very, I said almost like, Ari, really, that was that was just an accidental shot to the back or whatever. The guys mm-hmm. being caught mid movement or the contact really isn't that heavy, and you're going well, oh, okay. Then it's very hard because too many matches end up on that two warning or two foul position where it's like now you have to totally change what you do. You can't fight your fight. Um, but the the way I, I'd be looking through it is it's, it's kind of like you're you're very carefully trying to to balance something or you're spinning your Rubik's cube trying to get all the colors on the same sides and everything you do seems to mess everything else up. So mm-hmm. it's like well, okay, we'd love to see people throw spinning shots like the back kicks or the the band aids and everything, but if you're like if the warnings become a problem or if exits become a problem you don't want to throw those because you're going to end up on the ground or you're going to end up out of the ring and if those are one of the few things the referee needs to step in on and say well they're, they're probably going to be a big deal um things like how do you deal with a blitz well if the ring's smaller you can pressure the space more you don't give room for a blitz so it basically becomes more of a standing start but if there's that bit more room then you're going to use potentially techniques as well like you know the old, the classical defensive psychic you're probably going to travel halfway out of the ring with that you know That's particularly right. if you're a tall guy um like you look at that at say the 85s uh doing that like alamine or someone like that like i mean if he takes a defensive psychic he's covering four mats um yeah and uh you know some techniques are going to go away if you reduce the size of the ring maybe that's yeah. good maybe people like it but as you said, like you're talking about the plus 94s in, in, in Waco, like they're not throwing a lot of kicks. That's a small yeah. ring, like, you know, for them yeah. lads, yeah. So point. yeah, I suppose it sort of, um, it comes down to, and I think we've mentioned this once or twice, the, like the identity of the, the sport and like, you know, sort of what direction does it want to go in? And mm. that's actually a great example there that, we're, that you were just saying there, Adrian, about bigger the ring, maybe the fancier shots, smaller the ring, Less fancy shots, more hands. More of them. Um, yeah. So, um, but I think the, the, for me anyway, the common sort of goal, uh, so regardless of which direction it goes, I would, uh, the common one would be flow. 
yeah, increase yeah. well. Like, you know, that's, I think that's number one. And then whatever direction it could potentially go after that is sort of, yeah, the big ring and fancy shots will be good maybe to keep its identity as predominantly a kick and art. Um, mm. Obviously, there is hands, mm. but it's probably kicking. So that that could be it. it that's so what we're saying about awarding them um, them fancy shots, you know, the jumping, spinning shots or whatever. But yeah. uh, any f- first thing would be to just allow that continuation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's cool. Yeah. Mm. Just had I, an idea there, every too. hand um, continuation really get, gets broken up, really, doesn't it? Anytime Say somebody goes to ha- anytime hands. somebody goes to hands. Yeah, it's usually broken up. Like you don't even kind of get an opportunity to to break out yourself, really. To be honest, yeah, I'd say like provided that the shots are clean um, and there's not like not much hugging going involved going on inside, allow that flow. And then sort of a big tactic in ITF um, for the last couple of years now has been um, you know finishing with a turning kick mm-hmm. after the hands. And as you're saying, sometimes that doesn't even get to come off because the the ex- change has been has been killed off before the, the turning kick yeah. even even gets shown and um, so i just allow them to go on a little bit more and then we could see there's your maybe your, your finished turning kick to the head after an exchange or whatever it may be mm. yeah it's a, a, an interesting thought that's occurred to me there you know you think through your combat sports but one that never jumps to mind for me are the ones that don't usually jump to mind for me would be the likes of uh, judo or greco-roman where uh or even to some degree jiu-jitsu it just wouldn't jump to my mind first and foremost but like both Greco-Roman and uh, Judo have the, like, effectively, they have a golden score. In other words, you can end the match before time with a particular score. So that's right. That would be uh, a hell of a thing to play with in, um, you know, in ITF. And it wouldn't even necessarily need to be one, but it could be one of those things of like, well, you land that jumping, spinning headshot. There you go. You're true to the next round. You're true to the next round. I only... Um, I only copped that. I only was I was watching some judo clips there actually last week. Yeah, and uh, it's the ippon, isn't Ippon, it? Ippon, yeah. Ippon, yeah. Ippon, yeah. And, like you see them going for it, and like when they get it, then and like the crowd just goes nuts. Yeah. They go nuts. It's great. So like as you said, if we came up with one, maybe a I don't know, like a two touch back of air, something like that. Like you know, and seeing people going for that then, and if it did come in, oh Jesus, like. Yeah, that 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 spice things up for sure. Just based on that, there as well, the the whole idea of celebrations and like maybe your emotions getting the better of you, and you celebrating if something goes your way. What what are your thoughts on that? It's an interesting one because um, you know, one side of me goes, yeah, emotions are high. It's a World European Championships. There's a lot of work that's gone into this, and it should be allowed. But there's a line there, like, and I definitely noticed there. I think they're tidying up a little bit, but there was a time in Wacko where they let that go way too far. Okay. You know, they're way too far. They're nearly like footballers, you know, celebrating yeah. scores and wins and stuff. And that's where I'm off. Like, you know, Taekwondo is first and foremost an art and stuff, and there's got to be discipline there, and that that definitely got to be checked. But you know, I remember, am I right in saying World Championships 2015? It was it was said in one of the meetings that if so the time goes, you celebrate your win, you're going to be given a minus point. Me personally, I think that's a little bit extreme. Yeah. I don't. Like, I didn't see it happen. Maybe they they tried when we fought um, Ukraine in the final. They they were trying. That's it, right. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, it didn't pay off. Yeah. Yeah. It did happen with. I, I think I heard of it happening once. Like I, I didn't see it with my own two eyes, but I heard of it happening once. Um. So yeah, look, maybe it was just a little uh, like I think I fucking spit the gum shield anyway when I won um, and I didn't get a minus point, so so it didn't happen there. But yeah, I think Richie for for scores and stuff like that, I, I'd be looking to keep it at, like I don't think you really should be celebrating scores per se, like because you know you're still in there, you still got a job to do. Yeah, you, you haven't you haven't done it, you haven't won yet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think celebrating scores, I would be like, I'd be happy enough to penalise and leave, yeah. like, leave that out. But if somebody has just won a world title or a European title and it's nearly a lifetime's work, leave them have a little celebration. Yeah, know. yeah, I agree. Yeah. I I think it's like for me, it, it there's there's like a very very simple line. It's like if it if it actually interrupts the event, it's a problem. So then, mm. if the person's running off the ring and you know cheering away, <laughs> yeah. and can't actually award the results and carry on. Yeah, it's a problem. Or if it's 
pretty much just offensive to the other person or disrespectful to the other person, it's a problem. Yeah, that, that's like, different then. But you well, just yeah. be happy because you've achieved something. I don't think anyone can really have a problem with that, you know? And, you know, it's it, definitely, yeah. I, I think that's that's right. How is it at the moment? Did the um do you see because I know that that's always been a rule, hasn't it? Like sort of signaling for a technique, putting your hand up or yeah. something. That's always been a still a warning. warning but point. like the the big thing is that like I always say that the most experienced referees, the clever ones, will always go, You're not after getting close to a score there. You're yeah. trying to sway the judges. Go, hey you, you're getting a warning. And I think mm. that's that's how it should be. I think someone getting a score, uh, you know, they make that defensive side kick and, you know, they make the side step and a little bit of a fist bump. It's like, whatever, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, but they, you know, lashing a turning kick into the gloves and yes, you know, it's like, okay, no, that's, that's, you yeah, don't want like, from that competition. You'll be doing it left, right and center then as well. Yeah. Like, you know, like yeah. once you get close, yeah, that, that, that would have to be checked. Um, but yeah, definitely the yeah to conclude on that the the celebrations after a match leave it. But in the ma- in the contest, I'd be saying, nah, look, you still got a job to do. You still got to win it. So yeah, little penalised yeah. there if you. If you but, w- would you like to see um, time being paused? Uh, yeah, when we talked about earlier, sure. like the warnings and things like that, or even yeah. the the rounds being changed. Maybe I I was th- I, I I personally think two two minutes is a very short time for you to really showcase your skills and. And uh, I, I think it would it be fair to say it's one of the shorter combat sports. Adrian, I think you said something about karate before three minutes or something. Karate one three minute round in one three minute uh, round. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is. It's it's interesting because even at that, if if you look at how long their round their match actually lasts, it's much closer to five five and a half minutes because mm. they're every they are point stop, and every time there's a score or a warning given, the clock is stopped. So yeah. there is three minutes of action which is mm. probably not any different to how much action there is in a four-minute ITF match. Yeah. Yeah, yeah now, Richie, that would be, uh, especially, maybe for, like, you know, if it's going to be a quick warning, maybe no need to stop it. Like, you know, literally, yeah. hetcho, warning, continue. But if they're going to, if the business is going to be on about making you stand back in a particular section or if somebody's sort of trying to play the game in terms of fixing gloves and doing bits and pieces, that should be very strict, I think, you know, stopping it straight away. I and think then, the timekeepers need to be a bit more on the ball with that. And, and I think, it, but that's the problem. I think anything that comes down to interpretation and not having a set criteria, I think it, that's where it gets messed up because, of course, there's no set criteria of how long it takes to give a warning as well. And that's the initial problem or yeah. how long it takes you to adjust somebody. But like obviously that is that's already in play that the time should be stopped when it's necessary, but it's not happening is 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 the problem. Like this brings me on to something as well. I, I remember I used to see this in, in Wacko a fair bit actually. Like, you know, it would happen sometimes where you know, maybe it's an intense match, there's a lot going on in the arena, maybe it's a long day, people make mistakes, right? So that's fine. So the they sort of the play has stopped for whatever reason for a particular amount of time, and the, the timekeeper maybe forgets the whole time, or the referee forgets the signal the whole time, one or the other. And the opposing coach is going nuts, saying, "What well, we're after wasting seven, eight seconds there, whatever it may be." And so maybe there's a little referee meeting, or maybe they say, "Okay, well, what we'll do is, um, the time the guy at the table has a phone, we." we will time seven seconds and then we'll resume the, the scoreboard, the, sorry, the, the official time. And everyone's happy with that. It's very sort of, it's, it's like, there's no sort of set, um, how do I even explain this? It's very subjective, like, yeah. you know, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a good way to sort of solve the problem. Like, you know, we've all seen it in ITF. I've seen it, I'm sitting there and like, you know, the clock is t- literally ticking away. And then maybe the time is up or maybe there's whatever left. And one coach or fighter is going crazy. But now I could be wrong on this. Correct me if I'm wrong. I've never seen it sort of being given back. I've never seen them go, okay, look, the official time has run out, but let's put 10 seconds on just on my phone and give you an opportunity. And um, that little bit of subjectiveness, I think, should be introduced, especially where there's human error. It can happen like, you know. I actually think like that, if you get to the point where you actually automatically stop the clock when the referee stops the match, fixes everything. that in conjunction mm. with not stopping the match half as often, you know, would be, would be ideal because then it's like, there should be, you know, it's just, yep. 
H.O. clock stops. Um, and, you know, it's an interesting thing that you could potentially get into that situation as well, where if the top table are sharp, if H.O. is called and the clock stops, the scoring is turned off too. Mm. So you don't end up nice. with those very controversial, that was a score after a H.O. after a break, you know. So <laughs> that could be good as well. But I definitely think, you know, in particular where it's two by two, even if we didn't go to the three twos, that, yeah, you want to use all that time for action. But you don't want to have that exp- expand out, you know, by by having all of these stops that are taking up, you know, seven and eight seconds. Like most of the times, the warning should be very, very quick to give, you know. And it is literally hecho, Juliana, Gesuk, and on we go again. And it's mm. that's very quick stop start kind of thing. And really, the ones that I'd be looking at, uh, you know, in terms of do we really need to see as much of them? It's mostly the acts. It's the clashes. It's the yeah. accidental low shots. And it's the amount of times that you have to break up the, the fight because the fighters go in and they know they can't clinch. So they have to push forward or they have, they have to do something to get the referee to break the match because they can't, the shots that they have that would work in close aren't really liked. They, you know, you've, you can't clinch, you can't hold, you've, you know, so you've got to do something from there. So, you know, that's asking the referee to step in, give one person a warning or, or, you know, or just break and go again. And most of the time, those should be literally as they are in, you know, kickboxing or boxing. It's like, head show, break, go. And, yeah. you know, just literally step back, go. And, you know, not even the, you know, almost the nothing happened, but just, yeah, it's obvious nothing has happened here. Okay, break. Go. What 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 if you had somebody else who was dictating the warnings apart from the centre referee? Oh, I've never thought about that. No, not me. So what, what do you a, mean? Somebody from the table signals down that it should be a warning? Yeah, or the referee when they see a warning like it is with first point, they stop the match. Uh, and, and then maybe I don't know if there's a bit of communication there, or maybe there's somebody with the JP who who is deciding that okay, yeah, that, that, that's a, a justified warning that, and a warning is added on as the time is stopped or whatever. Well, I definitely be. think that could be the case for minus points because they're yeah. so, influ- they're so um, sort of influential on how the match might go. Mm. Um, but in terms of not, not actually the JP, but somebody, somebody's job is actually to give warnings. Um, yeah, see, it, it, I suppose it's complicated then because like how, how is that shown clearly, I suppose, because when the centre referee stops the match and says, okay, there's a warning on this side, everybody knows it's a warning. But if yeah. someone else has that job separately, I suppose it, it kind of, it kind of um, mixes communication a little bit there and it, m- it might be not as clear, but uh, it, m- it might be something to, to look I'm at. I'm just thinking out loud here, like literally, I, I don't know if this would work. If there was a button on the, so you know, for their, their scoring pads, so if a ref sees an instance where maybe there should be a warning and if they were to stop the match, and you either press if it was a warning or if it wasn't. And it goes up majority. I don't know. Just, just sort of thinking about that, as you yeah, say, because I've never thought about that. It's, it's, it's a good area to think about. Mm. Um, something that uh, when Adrian was speaking there, it got me thinking as well. Um, I think it could be beneficial too, and I've spoken to a few people about this, if more competitors sort of put themselves forward to referee, um, and that's something that I think we, we could all partake in because we all know there are certain instances that just, they're very great. You know, you can't sort of learn them in a course or anything like that. It's sort of very feel, you know, or just what you see and you've got to make a judgment call. Um, and so maybe athletes, would, they, a lot of referees are good at making the call, but athletes from their experience being in there, might make that call pretty good too um, and there was actually there was one instance at the at the Worlds I remember there was an English girl fighting an American girl and it finished as one uh, for blue and three for a draw and the referees gave it as a result to blue yeah um, and I remember it was so the American girl had, was on the losing side of it and it was actually Julio Carlos came sprinting over the barrier and ran on and was saying like that's a draw and it was just nobody really picked up on it um, so again, like that, look, human error, as I was speaking about earlier on, but I think people who have really experienced it and seen it and been in all the um, scenarios really has a, a good eye for them things. And it could be handy if 
if more people sort of contributed to that. Now, the only thing is a lot of competitors want to go into coaching. Mm. So a sort of a solution I had and that I thought about was perhaps, so when some people as a referee for a championships, they're a referee for the whole week. When someone's a coach for the championships, they're a coach for the whole week. Imagine if there was a Saturday morning when there was all semifinals and finals and there was a coach, let's say, who was a former competitor and they were asked maybe for a high-level matchup that was going to be quite intense, quite explosive, a lot of sort of quick decisions to be made, if they were asked to throw on their umpire in a tyre for a couple of matches, if they weren't busy coaching. Just thinking out loud to encourage that sort of uh, give back from competitors, you know? I think it's one of those things that, like, I think a mutual appreciation for the, for the job is really the, the thing it's that's tough job. Like, It's I a very think, tough job, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's where... Like they are unique, are they are definitely separate skills, and I think as a base for each one, you want some experience yeah. on the mat. Like that's right. Like to be a good coach, you want you, you don't have to have done everything you your competitors are going to do, but you need to have some experience on the mat really to get a good grasp. But hey, how's that man? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but likewise to be you know a good referee, you've got to kind of know what's going on on those mats in front of you, and you know there's nothing like a bit of experience of being on the mats to kind That's of. That's it, and then I suppose it, it comes back to as well, like you know, and it's something that I definitely like want to. I'd love to start getting involved in and stuff. Well, especially when my own sort of competing career is over, like you know, because it's very easy for me or anybody to sort of sit back and say this is wrong. They shouldn't be doing this. Referee shouldn't be doing that. Well, get out there and sort of, you know, provide something. And I'm, I'm a hundred percent on them lines that, as we said, it's a tough job. It can be a tank, tankless job. Um, and that's why I think uh, more competitors getting involved and like, you know, feeling what, the, and th- that would then help sort of with these rules, if there was ever rule changes to be made or some a direction of the sport, if there was more interaction rather than referees over this side, competitors over this side. I think and you definitely hit the nail of the head there that you don't want to have those in silos. Like the way you create the sport is you have the, like the cooperative efforts of the coaches, the umpires and the, the athletes. And like when all three are working in harmony to make the sport better, you get a great sport out of it mm. when they when each section feels like there's something separate and that they have to advocate for their side i think it gets yeah. adversarial and it's not good you know that's it and like you know because as you said if we have them divides then it's like well you don't know what it's like from our point of view and they're saying well you don't know what it's like being in there so if there was a little bit more interaction there i think it's only for the better and only for the positive and then we can say well hold on i found when i was competing X, Y, Z, or I found from a referee's point of view, it's very difficult to make these impulsive decisions. Yeah. It has to be a discussion, whatever it may be. But uh, I think that's an area that should be looked at, maybe a little bit more crossover, as you said, between coach, competitor, and referee. Yeah, I think that uh, idea as well of, of getting the right calls, and, and as we were mentioning earlier, things being open to interpretation, I think that, that actually is a good opportunity, especially with the times that we're in now, of bringing a little bit more technology in. I know that uh, other sports are kind of like WT have brought in like uh, sensors and things like that. And when we were speaking to Dominic uh, yesterday, uh, Adrian, he was mentioning that, that idea of maybe having technology coming in to help scoring and a little bit like that as well it, so any suggestions or ideas of where you'd like to see technology bring it to to make things a little clearer and i suppose um the first one i think about when when we discuss that is video replay but in my opinion it does slow it down doesn't it like you know if you're gonna have to sort of stop a match and get the screen up and have a look back. Um, and then I suppose because we don't wear the protective equipment that WT wear, it's, it's quite difficult to get the electronic stuff in. So um, it's something that I've never really thought about. So I suppose video replay, in my head anyway, is probably the most logical thing. And obviously then put a system in place that you can't be doing it every, every match because we all yeah. know a few coaches who probably be on it. Mm. all the time well, well, yeah. I know they have a card don't they and, and if, you, right, yeah. if you lose it it's gone or something or something like that yeah. Yeah, yeah I think the biggest difference though is like you look at the cost of doing something like that and WT are you probably doing that on three rings you know at a major championships in a football match they're doing it in one pitch yeah. and if you're talking about ten rings <laughs> like it's it's astronomical uh, and the logistics of running it and all the rest of it I think you just have to accept sometimes like you know we're, we're going to have inaccuracy um, yeah. you know 
But I think where uh, VAR or, or like the video replay type stuff would be very useful uh, in terms of having like at least centering with, uh, you know, it could be something that you could introduce at just for semifinals, finals, mm. or, you mm. know, something like that. Or even potentially like initially don't even use it for, you know, coach and athlete benefit for the first while until everyone is well accustomed to the, equi- the equipment being there. But use it for referee training. You know, have the, yeah. you know, have the matches with multiple angles, with your top down, with your various angles and, you know, do like, they're amazing at this. Like I've seen like documentaries on it in the NBA, you know, because every minute of everything that's mm. happened is captured in 26 different angles and the whole lot of it. And they have a whole like, you know, multi-story building full of video analysts watching the games to basically track everything that's happening for the for the referees for their training now the referees are paid very very well in the nba but the the point that they'd make is um people are not aware of their own little biases their uh, the decisions like they were finding that like the top players could get away with more because mm. they were known to be the top players okay, and yeah. the more they showed referees themselves making the decisions that they were making and just let them reflect on it the better the referees were getting at making tough decisions correctly under pressure. Um, now they're under more pressure because they know right, everything I do mm. is being watched from 26 yeah. different angles. This is crazy. <laughs> but the ones who could hack it did very, very, or, you know, did get really, really good. But I mean, if you were just talking from a simple level of, look, we want to help everybody get better. Let's get better data. Let's see what happens in there. Let's have, rather than trying to find a match off of Facebook, that was, you know, uploaded via, you know, 720p uh, live stream at some point, you know, having like five angles, basically a 360 composition in HD that you can go back to play forward, back, rewind. You know, I think that would be a huge training tool to help everyone really. But even as well, um, that's like, that stuff would obviously take it to a serious level. But I know you got uh, at the squad sessions and stuff, this is done at, on a lesser level. And even if this was done at club level, you know, when um, the umpire courses are run uh, together with the squad sessions. Yeah. Like, I'd love to know how, uh, how many referees would maybe, how many times in a year do they ref? Or, um, and like, you know, is it just maybe a couple of big competitions? Like imagine just, so I presume they're all involved with clubs and stuff. And so then, and then the competitors benefit from this too. So like on a Tuesday night in a, in clubs around the country leading up to a championships, okay, you're going to do your simulated spars, like, you know, your simulated event. And if there's a referee in that club, they step up and they ref that match. So number one, they're getting the experience and then the competitors are getting a much closer feel to what it's going to be like at the championships and then have a big discussion after it. Then maybe you can go, why did you give me that warning? And there can be a big discussion there. And um, yeah, that I think I'd love to know. Now maybe a lot of the top referees do that, but I'd love to know how many do it and uh, if 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 it's a common practice. Yeah, I mean that that that's the kind of the amount of practice. I'm like I, I get this from the point of view of delivering coaching courses and so on. Like you know, I, I only get to do that four, five, six weekends a year. You know, and so every time you step on the floor, you're rusty. Mm, Whereas yeah. you know. If you're going into a competition to spar, the environment has changed. But you've stepped on the floor to spar hundreds of times that year before, you know, or what many times in the in the previous yeah. 12 months leading up to it. Whereas, you know, so if something isn't a practice skill, obviously it's not going to be as sharp. You know, it's going to take more concentration. And, uh, you know, there's very few referees who are, you know, refereeing every weekend. Uh, you know, it and that's not a judgment against them. It's just, that's just not how it is. Mm. So I think, yeah, that kind of thing, treating it as the highly skilled activity that it is, is actually, it's giving it more credit. It's giving it more kudos for what it actually is. And so saying, look, but you can be really good at this, but it takes practice. Yeah, that's it. And then like, it's just, it's a win-win for everybody then. So that, yeah. and obviously that's a lot more cost effective approach of having them. Um, Five, five cameras on a particular ring too like if we could get there eventually obviously unbelievable yeah um, but it's, it's, as it's you probably said, it's, inevitable though isn't it with, with the whole how technology moves and stuff like we, we probably wouldn't imagine having electronic scoring back in the day maybe as well so eventually it's going to have to go that way somehow so it's just a matter of time I think yeah definitely, definitely. 
Um, actually, another one then, just as you said that, Richie, and I suppose, Adrian, you're a good one just for me to ask this because you would have seen it a lot more than I saw. Um, the introduction of the scoreboards and people being able to see the score, how did you sort of find that influence sparring if, from any angle? I suppose to yeah. start with entertainment. Yeah, you see, this one's always, you know, a point of discussion. There's an awful lot of nostalgia around the, the idea of, you know, you just had something that was much more like what you'd imagine a fight would be like, as in the two guys go from the first bell to the last bell and they're fighting it out and they have no idea what the result is going to be, but they have a feel for the match, you know? Yeah. And they're fighting it out and they have a, a feel for what the score would be. For me, I've never had the philosophy that sparring is a fight. Okay. For me, the philosophy has always been that sparring is a game. Tough yeah. game. Uh, sometimes the game hurts, but, you know, it's effectively, it's a game and it's about winning. And so the philosophy is, well, we're competing with very poor data uh, when we don't have a scoreboard. Before the scoreboard, we didn't realize how important warnings were in some matches. You don't really know how accurate or inaccurate or, you know, a scorecard is when you can't see the scorecard. So how can you be like 4-3 in one corner and 27-9 in another corner? You know, that, that kind of thing. But those jumped to light once you had a scoreboard. We have that whole dynamic of I'm winning. Now I have a decision to make. What's my action that I take here? Or I've just gone behind because I conceded that third warning or because of that foul or because some referee is after giving that, uh, that psychic to the body but the other three didn't. So I'm only behind on that one card. Oh, I can stay the way I am. Whereas, you know, it, it really comes down to, for me, that's the difference. If you're looking to put on a spectacle for a crowd that is more like a fight, you take away the scoreboard. If you want to have a sport that's basically a game and is about finding winners and losers, uh, then for me, the scoreboard is an essential tool. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that seems like a good breakdown because even when I think back to... I suppose Argentina, you weren't able to see the score. No, um, no. Sweden, then you were. Mm. Uh, yeah, you I, I see was, the individual scores. I think you could see the judges. Is that right? So I think it's interesting because I think in Sweden in 2010, you had the polar scoring system with the big uh, neon scoreboards, and then in 2011 in New Zealand, I don't think we had. I don't think we could see the scores. I think we could see them, but we couldn't. No, we couldn't see the individual scores. We could see the judges. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's it. And uh, and then I think after that, from 2012 onwards, I think it was they were there. Mm. Yeah. Um. And it's actually interesting then because I remember Richie, you were at this as well. European Cup 2014. I remember for whatever reason, you could see the judges, but you couldn't see the scores. So it was the first competition in a while I'd gotten used to seeing scores and stuff and it was interesting that you know let's say when I had if I had 4-0 on the board I'm going lovely like 4-0 mm -hmm. but it actually it, I was thinking of 4-0 as in great like you know I'm, I'm cruising here and then one psychic and a drift yeah. back so that even the so the differences between seeing the score and not seeing the score and then there's even a subcategory to that I suppose being able to see the judges Mm. and not being able to see the score it's interesting like you know how it I, th I think it's after bringing way more um, like a professional mindset towards a whip for, for competitors and coaches because now they're actually worried about warnings they're worried about spacing yeah. more they're worried about uh, all these other things that like it's interesting because me and Adrian are doing a breakdown of, a, of an old match from 2004 tomorrow and, and oh uh, nice yeah and you actually don't see that same, you know consideration, consideration as such exactly so like people are just drifting out of the ring aimlessly yeah. as such because it's not really a threat to them from their point of view so I, I think it's definitely after increasing the sport yeah and improving it uh, uh, overall yeah I definitely think like you know that's a good uh, sort of analogy Adrian use of whether it's fight or game because I know when when I'm watching a spar that I can't uh, that I can see the score you know there's spars you're pulling your hair out because mm. you can see how close it is you can appreciate that literally one wrong foot here is going to change it and i really appreciate that then on the same time of not not being able to see it and two lads are just sort of throwing mm. leather a bit yeah. i also mm. like the idea of that like so it's, it's sort of whatever side of the coin you're on isn't it yeah oh definitely and but like for me i what i did like about the instruction scoreboard is that from a uh, by then i was already 
basically retired from competing myself. Like, I don't think I ever, no, actually, sorry, I did in Viking Cup uh, in 2009. I think I, I they had the, the uh, polar scoreboards. So I think I had won maybe two competitions in total that I could actually see the score and everything else was different. European but, Cup. Remember that one, Adrian? Oh, was there? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a little later. Um, <laughs> I was a little later. Uh, but the, uh, for me, the difference as a coach is, you know that feeling that you get when you're coaching patterns and someone walks out and even when they look at the scoreboard now, it doesn't help. But, you know, you're walking out, they're coming to you for advice and all you can think of to say is like, well, maybe that could be better. That's the thing you could do that was better. Mm. Whereas now with a scoreboard, you can be very, very definite about that wasn't working, get no return on that. You only got that back in that corner. You'd be lucky if one judge could see it. You're after conceding six one, and you know you you weren't at the races there in terms of mm. your ring position. You, you, you know you didn't control the distance well. Now we have things to go back and improve for the next time. You know you, you have good measures of when you're in control in the match when you're not. You've got levers you can pull, and I think when it's just you know fight it out, let's see who comes out on top at the end. You can watch back the replay, but when you don't know if mm. that sidekick got two points. Yeah. Did it get two points from two, mm. three, four judges, etc.? Like you, it, it's very hard to tell what's effective, what's working, what's not working, what's getting re, you know a return off the judges, and and that's a huge deal because like if you even go back to two thousand seventeen versus two thousand and nineteen, like the blitz was getting a lot more scores in two thousand and seventeen, right. and even more probably in two thousand and fifteen. In two thousand and nineteen, much more of them were spoiled. You know, like yeah. people are getting better at slipping the head or stepping into it a little bit, not letting the punch extend or, uh, you know, they, they're, they're standing taller and the, the blitz is kind of coming in against the chest or something like that. You know, that you, people are finding lots of different smaller ways to spoil the shot. And, you know, so technically they've still done everything right. They, you know, in terms of they picked the right positioning, distance, timing, interrupted the rhythm well, they've got into a contact. The, the, the person has spoiled the contact. So you're kind of at that point of like, if you can't see what's happening on the scoreboard, you still kind of feel like that's the, you know, we need to keep drilling this shot. This, this shot is working for us. Whereas now we can look at it and say, no, it's almost working, but we need to adapt something to it. You know, mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to make sure we're getting the, the return on the scoreboard that setting up that shot deserves. And, uh, you know, I think that's just one of the things that, you know, from the point of view of a well-rounded and developed and mature sport, I think we need that you know mm. yeah yeah definitely that's cool yeah it's been a good chat lads we, oh, we, we, had a few yeah, good we bits. covered a lot <laughs> yeah yeah what was it uh, it's been almost an hour and a half and it, yeah 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 Jeez, and if there was a bottle like that if there was a bottle of corona over there i'm sure we could go for another hour <laughs> <laughs> brilliant that was um, i think we covered most things mm. yeah yeah there's, yeah it's an endless topic, you know. Ah, it like is. You here point, how would you how would you change it if you could push push or pull at it? I think that's a topic for everybody for all time. Mm. Yeah. You no. Know? Yeah. So so I suppose it's a good place to leave it there, I suppose, lads. Yeah. All right, Perfect. yeah. Sounds good. Great chat. I appreciate it, Adam. Thanks for coming on and sharing your experience and opinions with us. No bother, lads. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. No worries. Good to see you, man. Catch you soon. Good, good stuff. Chat to you later. Lads. Good luck.